So thank you for uh, to the uh, uh, organizers both for inviting me in for the patients in, in, uh, in, while, I, while I took some time arriving. Um, and to whoever switched with me today. Anyway, so we, we heard from Jean-Philippe Jean about many ways in which the universe uh, agrees with our, our theory and uh, ways in which we'd like to see it disagree and even one in which we do see it disagree. And I'd like to tell, tell you about more ways in which the universe does not appear to be agreeing with it, in which our observations do not appear to be agreeing with our theory, which may turn out to be just uh, statistical fluctuations, but at least for the moment seem to be rather intriguing. And this is work I've done with a number of people, uh, uh, all of whom are listed here, or at least most of whom are listed here. And it has to do with the large-scale properties of the cosmic microwave background, or the large-scale properties of the universe as revealed in the cosmic microwave background. So we look up in, looked up in the microwave sky in the 1960s, a map would have looked something like this, which was kind of boring. Within a few years, we were able to make a map that looked something like this. Actually, we weren't able to make a full sky map, but we were able to see the effects of our motion through the universe by 1971. It was another 20 years before we were able to make a map that looked like this, where we could finally see the types of inhomogeneities that we thought were really interesting uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 5. And as you can see, what we were dominated by, though, is the, uh, the effects of the galaxy. Uh, in the 2000s, we were able to send our probes outside of the galaxy and make maps in which we no longer saw the galaxy, but saw the whole sky. And of course, we didn't send the probes outside, but we were able to subtract the effects of, of the galaxy by combining multiple wavelengths of, of, the, uh, of the light that we were looking at. And by now, we're able to make much more detailed maps of the sky, the microwave sky, and what most of our interest has focused on over the last few years is the improvement in angular resolution that we're getting, being able to go up to higher multipoles. But what I like to do is go back and look at what is the property of it that we're seeing on the largest angular scales, not on the smallest angular scales. So if we're looking at small angular scales, probably the talk would be how do these maps support the canonical cosmological model, and by this point, uh, that would lead you to be snoring by the end of the talk. Because we've, we've heard all those talks, right? And they're fascinating. It's amazing how well we do with cosmology. But what I'd like to do instead is look at how these maps challenge the cosmological model. So please, no snoring. Okay. So if I'm going to talk about how these maps challenge the cosmological model, I'm going to talk most about two things and mention a few other things. I'm going to start by talking about alignments of multipoles at low L. Or in other words, the full sky failure of statistical isotropy. So in cosmology kindergarten, we learn that the universe is statistically isotropic. And then we go ahead and analyze our data on the assumption of statistical isotropy. We should, go, of course, go back and check our assumption. Then I'm going to look at what's often called the Lowell problem, and I really want to argue is the large angle problem, which is the vanishing of the two-point correlation function. And at the end, I'll mention, as long as I have time, parity, uh, the dip in the first peak, and north-south asymmetry. And I'll argue that while we may live in a cosmological paradise, there may be hints that we're getting thrown out of the garden. So if we look at a CMB sky, whether it's this one or this one, and it'll turn, it doesn't matter very much which one it is. Um, what we're told to do, uh, uh, right when we learn cosmology, is what you have to do is you have to expand with such a map in uh, spherical harmonics. Okay? Or if it was a polarization sky, say it's been two spherical harmonics. And the reason is that our standard model for the origin of these fluctuations tells us that the coefficients of this spherical harmonic expansion are independent Gaussian random variables with expectation values that depend only on the value of L. And statistical isotropy tells us that any pair of them is independent unless they're the same one. And I should have had a start. 
So the sky is statistically isotropic and Gaussian random tells us that all interesting information the sky is contained in this CL, and so we should try to do our very best at estimating that number. So we should do something like take the, the, the average of the ALM squares because that will tell us what CL is. And when we do that, of course, we get beautiful plots like this that we can make six parameter fits to. And of course, by now, these plots have gotten much, much better. And it is truly amazing how well this fits. And the first thing we learned from that is that the location of the first peak is in such a, in such a position that omega is very close to one, the universe is very close to flat. But of course, we learned many, many other things. We, we know those six parameters to a, you know, a percent, or a few percent, or a fraction of a percent, depending on which map and, and which combination of data. But once we've learned that, once we've learned that the universe is very close to flat, the question is, one question is, at least, is is there anything interesting left to learn about the universe on large scales? Now, starting, oh, I guess in the early 90s, people started to, to notice this, what was called Lowell anomaly. In other words, the fact that the quadrupole of the CMB was low. This was completely <coughs> misguided. The, CM, the quadrupole was not that low. It has about a 10% probability of, of being this low, this far outside the, the cosmic variance uh, error bars. But nevertheless, that's historically what motivated people. It'll turn out, as I'll argue, that that's not what you should look at. So you shouldn't confuse the fact that the quadrupole is low with, the, with what is actually strange about the universe on large scale, just because that's what got people started. But it is what got people started. In fact, I recall a walk with David Spurgel around the pond at the Institute for Advanced Study, if any of you have been there, in which we, said, we were walking along and saying, you know, why is the quadrupole low? And, and David said, well, maybe this has something to do with small universes. Something I'll talk about next week at George's uh, birthday party. Maybe it does. I don't know. That was also misguided. So there are many ways to look. At, if we're going to look at this assumption of statistical isotropy and start to challenge the standard model, we should at least what we should do is we should look at whether the properties of the CMB, other than the angular power spectrum, are actually agreeing with the predictions of the model. And there are many ways to do that, and I couldn't possibly talk about all of them. I'll start by talking about this one, multipole vectors. I'll end up mentioning angular momentum dispersion axes. Hopefully, I'll talk about north-south asymmetries, et cetera, et cetera. But I won't do, possibly do all of these justice. And I'm sure there are many more that I've, at this point, lost count. So let me start by talking about alignments of multiples. Well, when we talk about the dipole of the CMB, what we mean is, what we might mean is the sum over m of a1m, y1m. So we could talk about the dipole of the CMB in terms of the Y1 spherical harmonics, the L equals 1 spherical harmonics, and I can tell you what A1, 1, minus 1, and 0 is, but that's not usually how we talk about the dipole of the CMB. We usually talk about some direction that the dipole points and the magnitude of the dipole. In other words, we trade the three A1Ms for a vector and a magnitude. Why? Well, because this really is a vector. Actually, we don't really care what the sign of the vector is, but it's, it's a vector. It behaves like a vector. A really is a scalar. Only A1 depends on C1. So it's kind of a convenient way of thinking of the dipole as being a direction and a magnitude. In fact, that's probably how all of you have thought about a dipole. At least that's how I normally think about a dipole. I never think of it in terms of A1M. So when we start to wonder about some of these questions, we said, well, is there, can you think in some similar way about other directions? These folks, clearly, El Delaware Costa et al., were, were asking the same question. They said, well, for each multiple, I can find the axis NL around which the angular momentum dispersion, the sum over M of M squared AL M squared, is maximized. I'm not sure why that's, that's what they thought about, but it's, it's a thing you can think about. It's a direction associated with each multiple. And the results that they found was that the octopole is unusually planar. 
In other words, if we align our z-axis with this axis, the axis that maximizes the angular momentum dispersion of the L equals 3 multiple, then you get almost exclusively, or you're dominated by m equals 3. And it turns out that that axis, the one that maximizes the angular momentum dispersion of the quadrupole, octopole is the same, pretty much the same one that maximizes the angular momentum dispersion of the, of the quadrupole, in other words, they're aligned. So that's what they pointed out. Now, what we were interested, though, is, is, is noticing that if a dipole can be written in terms of one vector, then that suggests you could write the lth multiple in terms of L vectors. After all, the product of L angular momentum 1 objects includes an angular momentum L object. Okay. So you could multiply them all together, and as long as you subtracted the appropriate traces, you could trade your 2L plus 1 ALMs with L unit vectors and a scalar. And those L unit vectors really are vectors. They transform as vectors under rotations. The A really is the scalar, and the information about CL is, is contained in AL once you know the UL vectors. So it's just another way of thinking about spherical harmonics. You trade the spherical harmonic uh, coefficients for vectors. We were very pleased with ourselves, thinking we had invented something wonderful. Uh, and then we discovered that someone else had written, um, had written uh, the ELF multiple in this way, as the ELF directional derivative of the 1 over R potential. You may have heard of this fellow, his name was Maxwell, and he did it in this uh, little-known textbook. So. And there are still branches of physics in which this is how you represent uh, uh, multiple, uh, uh, the ELF multiple. Just not particularly in particle physics or cosmology. So it's a useful and different way of thinking about Elf multiple. So the, the dipole you can think of as a, a direction and a magnitude. The quadrupole you can think of as two directions and a magnitude. The octopole is, and I don't have a third arm, where I pointed in the third direction, three directions and a magnitude, etc. And that suggests that you might want to think also about the area of vectors. So the quadrupole has two vectors, so you can think of it as a plane. Okay, and we can think about the, the axis of that plane. The octopole has three vectors, so you can think of it as three planes. And the statement about the, um, the, planari the, the planarity of the octopole, okay, the fact that it's dominated by m equals 3, is saying that the three planes of the octopole are very close to parallel with each other. And that's another way of describing what Oliver Cross et al. said. And that, those, that the, the normal vectors to those three planes are very close to the normal vector to the, oct to the quadrupole. So in other words, what we have is a quadrupole, which you can think of as two vectors. So the plane of the quadrupole and the three planes of the octopole are very close to each other. So let me try to show that. I'm going to show it in a very old uh, projection because this is how we originally plotted it. And, and I, I, just for historical uh, sake, history sake, and then I'll show it to you as the data progresses. So there, you see here, the, the, this is the galactic equator. You see a number of dots here of different colors. And I will and, and lines, which are uh, curves, which are actually great circles. And let me tell you what they are. So first of all, these dark gray dots are the quadrupole axis, okay, the axis of the quadrupole, the, the normal vector, the area vector of the quadrupole. And I've plotted in both the north and south hemispheres, because we don't know which You'll notice that it's close to these three darker dots. And those are the, those are the normal vectors to the three planes of the octopole. It's easier to see down here in the southern hemisphere that they're all very close to each other because this one just happens to be, you can also think of this one as over here. So down, let's look down here where it's easier to see that all three of these planes are very close to each other, even though, remember, by statistical isotropy, the quadrupole and octopole should have nothing to do with each other. I haven't told you how the different planes of the octopole, how close they should be, but they should not be this close to each other. But no, should not be, I mean, that it's unlikely if we just randomly drew the a, A3Ms that they would end up this close to each other. And certainly the quadrupole should not end up so close to each other, and particularly should not end up basically at the center of the three, which amounts to the 
uh, what the limit of cost, the alignment of the quadrant will be on. Now, so they're all very close to each other. They're clustered on the sky that's saying something about how they behave relative to each other. You might notice that they're also quite close to this dotted, this dashed line. That's the ecliptic plane, the plane of the solar system. So why am I putting the ecliptic plane on here? Well, because one wonders if somehow what's going on here is something to do with the with uh, with um, systematic uh, errors. You know, maybe there's some error in how the data was analyzed, how the data was taken, some foregrounds associated with one of the physical systems in which we are forced to be embedded. Because unfortunately, we're not able to send our satellites outside of the solar system and outside of the galaxy to make these observations. So maybe it has something to do with the solar system. And the plane of the solar system is the ecliptic. And indeed, they seem to rely on the near, very near the plane of the ecliptic. They're also very near the dipole, the direction of our motion through the universe. They're also very near the equinox. Not sure how that would end up doing anything, but, the, but you know, when we ask the experimentalists, the observers, what should, what should we include on here? These are the things they said they could imagine somehow that their equations of time would, would have some error and somehow the equinox would, would go in there. And I always yell at Igor Tkachev for telling us that we should put the supergalactic plane in here. One of these vectors happens to lie on the supergalactic plane. Um, so what, what are we seeing in other words? So we're seeing, um, once again, we're seeing that we have the plane of the, the one plane of the quadrupole and the three planes of the octopole, which should be completely separated from each other, are very close on the sky. Those three planes of the octopole are also very close to each other. Okay? So all four of these planes seem to be quite close to each other. And I'll give you numbers in a second. They also seem to be quite close to either the dipole. Well, they seem to be quite close to the ecliptic. The dipole, our direction of our motion, is also quite close to the ecliptic. And they all happen to lie in about the same place. Now, one of those, the ecliptic, has to do with the solar system. Because presumably, the dipole has nothing to do with the solar system. It's just by chance that it happens to be on the ecliptic. Now, Area vectors tell about the orientations of the multipole planes, but they don't include all the information. Because I can still rotate around this common, for example, this common axis of these aligned planes. So let me just show you a picture to give you a better impression of how strange what is going on is. So this is a picture of the L equals 2 and 3 components of, this is I think W map 3. It doesn't matter which of, which of the maps you use, you get essentially the same picture. And what you see is a sequence of, a pro of six extrema that lie along a great circle that is perpendicular to the ecliptic. And the ecliptic also, in addition to the things that I just told you about the quadrupole and octopole defining a nice, a nice plane, the ecliptic very carefully separates the three strong extrema in the south and the three weak extrema in the north. So, what's the probability that the quadrupole and octopole planes would be disaligned just by accident? Somewhere between 0.1 and 0.6%, depending on exactly which version of the synthesized map that comes from multiple wavelengths comes from. Yeah, you use. Given that you have such aligned planes, Given that the plane of the quadrupole and the three planes of the octopole are this aligned with each other, what's the conditional probability that they would be, be this perpendicular to the solar system, to the ecliptic? Somewhere between about 0.2 and 1.5%. Given that you have quadrupole and octopole plane, planes this aligned and this perpendicular to the solar system, what's the probability that they'd be this, that they'd also be pointing at the dipole? Oh, 2 to 3%. And in principle, you should, you should be able to multiply all of these three things together. I don't know whether you should. I would, so I'll tell you, I, don't, I, I, I write this down here in red. Some combination of these should be multiplied together. So a p-value is probably somewhere less than 10 to the minus 5. What happens when you look at Planck? Do you get a completely different answer? No, you get the same answer. So here are the, for example, the quadrupole vectors. The, the, the round ones are the two multiple vectors of the quadrupole. 
And for, for four different maps, WMAP7, WF9, the SMIKE, and the NILC plank maps. Okay? And you see that it doesn't much make, make any difference which one, which map you take. There's a few degrees difference there. They end up giving you almost exactly the same area vector. Does it matter for the octopole? No, you get the same thing. You know, very little change, even less change. So here are the three the area, the three area vectors of the, of the octopole, they really don't care about which map you use. So this is not a problem of WMAP. It could be a joint problem of WMAP and Planck, but that suggests it's not a problem with the satellite. They were very, very different satellites. How they went about making their maps is very different. There were multiple different methods used. It wouldn't have mattered if I used the other, you know, any of the other two full sky maps of Planck, you get the same answer. Should point out that it's important in doing this, in seeing where exactly things are, that you subtract the kinetic di uh, the kinetic quadruple. Okay, so people always ignore the kinetic contribution to the quadruple. Uh, they don't make a big difference in C2, but they actually move the multiple vectors enough to matter. So for example, if you don't correct the quadruple uh, th this is, this is the, that axis that maximizes the angular momentum dispersion of the quadrupole. You can see it makes enough of a distance that the quadrupole and octopole vectors are actually much better aligned when you remember to, to, uh, to account for the Doppler quadrupole, something that Planck didn't initially do, but they do now. So, very strange. You see that it's still true in the Smica maps, as the Planck map, that in addition, this eclipt the ecliptic plane seems to carefully separate these stronger uh, extrema from the weaker extrema in the north. So we also see that there's some sort of north-south asymmetry defined by the ecliptic there. Okay. But this is this this. Um, don't look at the details of, of this. What's important here? is that all these numbers are around 99 point something, or, you know, uh, which, which basically says that no matter what statistic you use it, whether it's an S statistic, these are just two different statistics for measuring these alignments, that they tend to be unlikely, or at least have p-values at the level of 0.1 to 1%. How can we explain this? Could it be cosmology? Um, maybe. Um, it's hard to see how cosmology results. You can imagine cosmology resulting in the alignment of the quadrupole and octopole with each with each other, and of the three octopole area vectors with each other. It's hard to see how that would also result in the cosmology would result in the alignment of the quadrupole and octopole with our direction of motion through the universe, since a good deal of that has to do with the solar system's motion through in the galaxy. You also have to ask yourself, how do you get such a small a quadrupole that's much smaller than the octopole? Because that's an important feature here. That, that has, doesn't have to do with the alignments, but presumably is related. Systematics, I don't think anyone has suggested a systematic that gets all of these things correct. The galaxy has the wrong multiple structure. So people will say, isn't this due to the galaxy? Well, first of all, I'll point out that the alignments we see are not with the galaxy. We see no significant alignment with the galaxy. And also, and this is important for any foreground explanation, what we see here is y2, a, a, y, a y2 round that is predominantly y22. And a y, uh, y3m, an octopole that is predominantly y33. Most foreground explanations produce y aligned y20 and y30. So you often hear people talk about, oh, I have an aligned quadrupole and octopole from this foreground. And the, the two things that they don't notice are, first of all, that what they have, what they produce is a y20 and a y30 that are aligned. That's not what we see. We see a y22 and a y33, or y2 plus and minus 2, y3 plus and minus 3 that are aligned. And the second thing is most foreground explanations amount to perturbation theories in various vectors, and they naturally end up with quadrupoles that are second order in the perturbation theory and octopoles that are third order in the perturbation theory, and so they get octopoles that are smaller than quadrupoles. So that if you want to explain this with foregrounds, 
including the galaxy, you have to explain what, what we see, which is that we have about five times more octopole than quadrupole, and then what we have is a line YLLs, not YL zeros. Very strange. But maybe you think that somehow this is that, that this is all really coming from galactic contamination. Because remember, if you go back and think about those Planck maps, even in those Planck maps where we had where we had subtracted the galaxies, we still could see the galaxy quite clearly in there. So maybe what we're, what's going on is contamination due to the galaxy. So let's extract the galaxy and see what we what we end up with. And to do that, I want to come back to uh, I want to come back to our our graph of the angular power spectrum, and what we call the low, L, the, the low quadrupole, or the low L anomaly, and argue that what we really have is a large angle anomaly. And the angular power spectrum is actually quite poor at seeing what's going on at large angles, because it compresses all of the properties of large angles, appears to compress them down to a few multiples. What it actually does is it spreads them over many multiples. So what is the angular correlation function? Well, if you grew up before COBE, then it's the way that you measure the properties of the CMB. Because until COBE, that was what we basically talked about is the two-point correlation function of the CMB. In other words, take any pair of, of directions separated by an angle theta, take all such pairs, so multiply those temperatures, average over all such pairs on the sky, and you get the two-point correlation function. Now, the established lore is that since that contains the same information as the angular power spectrum, there's, after all, a transform that goes between them, just differently organized, it can't possibly be interesting. Okay? So we should concentrate on the angular power spectrum. Well, first let me point out that it's not, that's only true if you're using the full sky and you don't actually use the full sky to obtain the data. In the ensemble, it's only true if the sky is statistically isotropic, and that's what we're trying to test. But more importantly, you should recognize that, oops, that this is kind of a, a silly argument because it would argue that we should never use orthogonal transforms. Don't Fourier transform your data, it doesn't change the information, it just reorganizes. As I said, this is how people used to think about looking at the CMB or, or, or all sorts of other uh, astronomical data, cosmological data. Um, it kind of fell out of favor with COBE because people realized that statistically the thing that was more, more useful was the angular power spectrum because our theory told us that the CLs were <laughs> independent. Whereas the C of theta has much more complicated statistical problems. But nevertheless, in the fourth year hey, uh, data paper on, on uh, COBE, on VMR, they did plot the two-point correlation function. And it's interesting because although they never wrote about it in their paper, they talked about the fact that there's something odd here. And what's odd is that after about somewhere around 60 or 70 degrees, somewhere around here, this seems to be very close to zero. But you notice that they don't, they don't show that. They don't show what the, expectate, what the expected curve is in the model. So let me show you that in the W map data. So here, is the expected two-point correlation function with cosmic variance error bars around it. Now, you should be very careful about those cosmic variance error bars, because the value of C of theta here and here are, very, are, are highly correlated. So you can't just look at that and say, does my curve go through that? Well, the first thing you'll notice is that all of these curves, which are the data, don't go through it. I would argue you shouldn't worry about that. It's very easy to change that just by, for example, changing the quadrant. The thing you should notice is that for this curve, the red curve mark Q, the green curve mark B, and the yellow curve mark W, which are the data, and here I'm using the data only outside the galaxy, the part that you're supposed to really trust, that all of them come down and by about six, after about 60 degrees, they essentially sit here along zero very close to zero, much further from zero than the model suggests they should be. So what's odd about the data is that there is no correlation, is not that it disagrees with the theory, but that it agrees with a different theory. 
And that theory is that there are no correlations above 60 degrees. Except for this anti-correlation here around 180 degrees. Now there's this other curve here, two curves that, that agree with each other. Those are what you get from the full sky map if you just go ahead and uh, take its two-point correlation function. So in other words, if you take the data, including the data that you don't trust that's inside the galaxy, or if you reconstruct the sky using the, the part of the sky outside the galaxy, those are these two curves, then you get correlations at all angles. So remember, the data that you trust has no correlations above 60 degrees, but if you reconstruct the sky, or if you infer CLs right, by some method, and then produce a two-point correlation function, then you would say there are, or I, I might say you might fool yourself into thinking that there are two-point correlation, correlations above 60 degrees. So how, un how unlikely is this? Well, you have to have a statistic. And here's where we can start to say, well, there's an, only an ex post facto statistic. So Kobe never wrote down a statistic to measure the fact that the two-point correlation function was zero, above about 60 degrees. WMAP did. They suggested this one, the integral of C of theta squared d cos theta from 60 degrees to 180 degrees. And then what they were pointed out was that only 0.15% of realizations in inflationary lambda CDM with the best fit parameters have lower values than that. And that fact has not gone away, it, it did not go away in any of the WMAP maps. None of the WMAP data releases. What was the case is that if you look, use the full sky two-point correlation function, it was somewhat low. This value of S1 half should be around 50,000 micro k to the fourth. It was around 8,000 micro k to the fourth. But if you took the part of the sky outside the galaxy, the part that you really trusted, then it was only about 1,000. And the p-value of that was about 2 to 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And I said, it doesn't much matter which map you use. It does matter that you remember to correct for the Doppler quadrupole, but other than that, it doesn't matter. So what's going on? Well, one thing that's going on is that if you use, it turns out that all of the correlation that, is, that we see in the black line in the full sky, almost all of it above 60 degrees, is due to pairs of points, at least one of which is inside the galaxy. So either pairs of points both in the galaxy, or pairs of points in which one is in the galaxy and one is outside the galaxy. So somehow, when you include the galaxy, you discover that there are correlations, both galaxy-galaxy correlations and galaxy-sky correlations. But if you don't include that, you find that there's very, very little correlation. And so notice, when we impose a galaxy cut, that's this KQ75, we impose a galaxy cut, we end up with much less, also, even anti-correlation at 180 degrees. So almost all the correlations go away above 60 degrees. Now, is this an accident? So could this just be bad luck? Yeah. So, for example, if we take this, the, the sky, the full sky that we actually have, which, remember, doesn't have very much two-point correlation, much less than it should much less than expected. And we rotate it in all possible ways and ask how often do we end up hiding even what's left of the correlation behind the galaxy, the answer is a couple of percent of the time. So we're left with two possibilities. One is that to view this is that 0.03 to 0.1% of realizations of the full sky have so little cut sky large angle correlation, that that's a true statement, and either this reflects a 0.1% probable full sky two-point correlation function, or a 5% probable two, uh, full sky correlation function, and a 2% improbable alignment of the galaxy. So somehow, we either have two small coincidences or one big statistical fluke. Did this change in play? No, it looks exactly the same. Doesn't matter which map you use. You get the same two-point correlation function, slightly different axes here, same two-point correlation function. Did the fact that it's uh, 
due to due to uh, the part outside the galaxy. Uh, the, what correlation there is is due to the, uh, due to the correlations inside or between the galaxy and the, and, the, and the part outside the galaxy mass, which remember still does contain some galaxy co contamination. No, that didn't change either. And in fact, the effect is more dramatic in Planck if you look carefully. As you increase the size of the mass from covering about 18% of the sky to covering about 30, uh, you know, 30 to 35% of the sky, the correlations stop dropping at some point for, uh, for WMAP. In fact, they, they increase this S at one half. It plateaus somewhere around 1300, but for, for, for Planck, it continues dropping to around 1000. Now, what's, what's problematic about this, what's really troubling is, is that it actually requires a disturbing, what we might call, conspiracy. It requires, you might think, well, I'll just adjust my predictions for C2, C3, C4, whatever it takes, in order to get the right value. After all, let me, for example, just replace, let me, let me just replace the value, the theory, for C2, the predictions for C2, C3, C4, whatever, by what I see. And then if I, if I put, make that my theory by, for example, adjusting the infoton potential or doing whatever I need to do, then I'll get the right answer when I finish. Right? So I do go to realizations of that, and I'll get a small two-point correlation function. I don't. So if I take the theory, if I replace my theoretical CLs by their measured values all the way up to L equals 20, Cosmic variance would give only a 3% chance of recovering this low a value of this quantity S1 half in a particular realization. And the reason is that to get a low two-point correlation function requires the quadrupole, the octopole, the hexadecapole, and I never remember what C5 is, to balance themselves against the contribution of all the others. So you actually have the different CLs that are conspiring to give you low two-point correlation function. If you put that prediction into the theory, you don't recover those CLs. Right? You recover those up to cosmic variance, and that cosmic variance spoils the absence of two-point correlations. So to, to get zero two-point correlation function above 60 degrees requires covariance among the low LCLs. In other words, <coughs> Um, the observed absence of large angle co correlations is inconsistent with one of the most fundamental predictions of inflationary cosmology, namely that the CLs are statistically independent, that the ALMs are statistically independent if they have different L's. What we'd like to do is, so, so how do we know whether this is just chance or the, whether it's physics? Is there underlying physics behind it? And the approach we've, we've begun to suggest is, in the absence of a model, and so far it's been hard to, 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 to create a model, is what you can at least do is test the hypothesis that this is just a fluke. So what you can do is start creating what we call constrained realizations. This is, a, this is an old idea, but one that in, in this context has, has not been used. Namely, stop just pr producing realizations of lambda CDM with the best fit parameters or, or uh, parameters near the best fit parameters. Basically, if the best thing would be to take the sky and condition your, your models on that. Let's, let's, let's step back from that, that's a little harder. Let's condition our, our, our realizations on having the same CLs as the ones we observed. So let's produce skies that have the same CLs okay, within measurement errors that will automatically give us smallish full sky C of theta. We can then constrain them to have the, the appropriate cut sky phi of thetas, and then augment with realizations of other physical quantities, like polarization or the lensing potential, and see how our predictions of those things change. So for example, here's how the prediction of the cross-correlation between temperature and Q polarization changes, or temperature and lensing potential. And you can see that you get different predictions depending on whether you use ordinary lambda CDM with best fit parameters or constrained lambda CDM with best fit parameters. So our predictions change. And so there's some potential for testing 
If we end up with a value for the S1 half of TQ out here, that's, that's, that would be very unlikely in the context of constrained realizations. It would tell us that it's very unlikely that this is, this is actually a fluke. We can look at the autocorrelation of Q and, or of U, and we can predict how that runs. So notice, for example, that it's very unlikely in our theory in, uh, in the fluke hypothesis, the, in, in lambda CDM in which the TT correlations are just a fluke, that we'd also get zero correlations above 60 degrees for QQ and UU. So if we see zero two-point correlations for QQ and UU, which we would kind of expect if this is physics, that will tell us that it's probably not just due to a fluke. It would require another fluke, a completely independent fluke. So there are ways of making predictions based on the fact that we already see a zero two-point correlation function in the temperature to predict that we won't see a zero two-point correlation function in other properties if it's, if it's really just an accident. There are other predictions because I, I've been telling you that we measure the two-point correlation function. That's not actually what, what anyone ever plots. No one plots the two-point correlation function. What they plot is the monopole and dipole subtracted two-point correlation function. So, if that is really, the, if the fact that the two-point correlation function is zero, is physical, then the other contributions, the monopole and dipole contributions, have to be small. Well, I'm not sure what we mean by the monopole contribution, but the dipole contribution may have a physical meaning, and if you can actually detect it, if you can separate it from the Doppler dipole, and we can have a conversation about whether that, that can be done, Okay. then it has to be much smaller than the theory would suggest it should be. Instead of something around 3,000 micro k squared, it would have to be around less than 200 micro k squared. And then the question is, can you detect the dipole? As I said, if I had time, I would talk about a couple of other uh, um, anomalies. I think they're interesting, but I don't have time. I'll just, I'll just put them up there quickly. There is a, there is a parity problem. Hard to see here in the, in the kind of canonical paper about this, or one of the canonical papers about this. I think it's clearer here. Notice that the greens are the, the first, up to at least L equals 20, the greens, which are the odd parity multiples, are always higher than the blue. So there's the odd parity, uh, the 2L plus 1 parity always has more power than the L parity. That's kind of odd. It turns out to be connected, but not exactly the same thing as the anti-correlation at 180 degrees. Here's another one. There are actually three of these multipoles that are really surprisingly far from, from the prediction. Now, amusingly, um, if you look at, well, okay, amusingly, they are completely normal if you look at the data in the ecliptic plane, or near the ecliptic plane. All of the anomaly comes from data near the ecliptic pole, so out of the plane of the solar system. When people plotted it in WMAP1, there was a dip at the first peak, it went away. That was actually entirely due to the fact that all of that dip in the first peak, all of that dip that you see there, was concentrated in the region near the north ecliptic pole. And they changed the way in which they weighted the map. That's, that's all that happened. So they changed what they reported. So by the way, I, I think that suggests that we should beware when, when anomalies go away because of new and improved systematics or new and improved analysis. Because there's a, there's a, there's a kind of confirmation bias. So all that was really happening was not, not that the data was changing, but that what, we, what they reported changed. And finally, there's this north-south asymmetry. So here's the CMB dipole. And then what some people report this north-south asymmetry in a number of ways. But here's, I think, maybe the most interesting. They make what's called a sigma map, centered on caps, pointed in different direct, uh, centered at different places in the sky. Um, so in particular, Amandar Benue has done a lot of work on this. But other people too, Erickson and Gorski and um, Hansen. So here, here is the CMB, uh, here is the CMB dipole, and here is the sigma map for discs that are uh, for, for L equals four to ten, 
Here it is for discs that are 30 degrees. Here it is for discs that are 45 degrees. Here it is for discs that are 60 degrees. And you notice that there's this asymmetry between north and south where we seem to have strong stuff down here and weak stuff up here. Strong stuff in the, south, in a, the southern ecliptic sky, weak stuff in the northern ecliptic sky. So, to summarize, if you believe the observed full sky CMB, there are many signs that the sky is not statistically isotropic. Low L alignments, parity, the dip in the first peak, the north-south symmetries, these are very statistically significant. Now, maybe you don't believe the CMB inside the galaxy is reliable, and then the CMB lacks large angle correlations. This was first seen by Kobe with a p-value of about 0.05, is now statistically much less likely, somewhere between 100 and 200 times less likely. And this lack of correlations or power could be due to statistical fluctuations, but it's unlikely. It could be due to features in the infoton potential, but not only is that contrived, it has a very low chance of producing such little two-point correlation function. It could be due to topology, which was actually David Spurl and I were talking about when we were walking around that pond. But so far we have seen no signs of topology out to 98.5% of the distance of the last scattering surface. And so while the cosmic orchestra may be playing the inflation symphony, somebody gave at least the base of the tube the wrong score, and they seem they're trying very hard to hush it up, and there's no good explanation for any of this yet. So I encourage you to find it. Thank you. So, so people, I mean, I say no because, so, um, because people have tried to do that. If effectively, that's what uh, Upshorty and um, um, Gus, Gazal, what's Gazal's last name? Gus Vajani and uh, Kuri Trump did. Okay? And, and you can improve the situation a little bit. But remember, what, what you do then is you change the expectation values of the C sub L's. Okay? So you can get. C2, C3, C4, you can get them to be lower. But we don't see, there's two ways to get zero two-point correlation function. The first one is, make all the CLs zero. That gives you zero two-point correlation function. It's not what we see. We see a conspiracy between C2, C3, C4, and C5 to cancel the contributions of C6, C7, C8, C9, C10, etc. And to cancel each other. So they are set up to, to, you know, to cancel each other, to work together in order to make that plot. I mean, that's... You, you have something that's kind of flat above 60 degrees, okay? but not flat below 60 degrees. And so to do that requires covariance among the CLs. That does not get put in by changing, just changing the, the gravitational potential. Why not? I mean, if I have a complicated one uh, with structure and so on, I am... Um, oh, sure. I would log of things, uh, just oh. assume something unknown. So what you're saying then, what you're saying is effectively, is I could take, I could create an ISW that precisely cancels the Sachs Wolf. So even though my Sachs Wolf is dominantly produced on the left scattering surface, I could have an ISW that is arranged in order to cancel the Sachs Wolf effect. Brilliant. That would be wonderful. I, and it absolutely would be an explanation, and it would be very, very surprising, right? It would be very, it would be an explanation though, but it would be very surprising. And, and absolutely, you're right. But then we would have to understand how does how does the ISW along the site know to cancel the Sachs Wolf at the last scattering surface, right? And 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 you need you need a theory that, that, that predicts how that happens. And so it, it may have we may be able to produce such a thing, um, and and we we even thought a little bit about how to do that. In some sense, that was what Curie and all were were trying to uh, Shorty Curry and Justin Johnny were trying to do, um, and and. In the end, could all, all they could do is conspire to make the CLs smaller, not to make them, you know, make them work with each other well, to, to, to have good covariance. Glenn, would it be a, a, a proof that these things are real if we found them in the angular correlation function of the whole side galaxy survey? Yeah, so, so I didn't put that one up there. So, so basically, what, what we said is, 
Um, so we, what we effectively have is the two-point correlation function of the sachs wolf at large angles. I mean, there's some I, ISW as well. Okay. So that's at very high, you know, two to ZZ. So what you'd like to do is bring one or both of these into the interior of the last scattering surface. And so there's very, a number of ways to do it. You could, you could look at temperature polarization. You could look at temperature lensing. You could look at lensing, lensing, or lensing polarization, or polarization, polarization, or temperature galaxy, or galaxy, galaxy correlation functions. Any of those in which, you know, in which now you're, you're, at well, set, you're well inside the last scattering surface with one or both of those, those arms of your two-point correlation function would be good test because if this is a fluke, you, should, you shouldn't see the two-point correlation function still vanish. In other words, there's kind of a, a simple alternative model, which is that it's not the angular two-point correlation function that's vanishing. It's the three-dimensional two-point correlation function that's vanishing. Right? And now we can go test that phenomenological model, even if we don't know how to put that in yet into our physics. So yes, if we could get, if we could get two-point correlation functions in object catalogs, at, at the appropriate separations, which by the way means you have to be out beyond redshift two, okay? Because about 180 degrees apart at redshift two is about the same as 60 degrees apart at redshift, in, you know, in a thousand. This can be done with the SK. Yes, exactly. It can be done with the SK. I don't think it can be done with anything else. Yeah. Not yet. You got it. Then you really have to you really rule out whether it's a type of our own position and you can learn a lot about this. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that's one of the things on our list that we haven't gotten to, but yeah, that's that would be a really interesting calculation to do. So we should talk. <laughs>